Okay, so here we are in our Women of the Word New Testament edition. Um, tonight's woman does not have very many, um, I like to do this to you guys, I like to tease her first and then tell you who she is in case you hadn't noticed yet. Um, her story is pretty short. We are actually only given three verses of her story. And you think, Andrea, are you really going to teach for an hour on three verses? I had to cut my note short, ladies, okay, because you know me. There's a lot you can get. These are, in my defense, it's a very meaty three verses. There's a lot to unpack here with this woman. Um, I won't leave you in suspense. Her name is Anna. We're going to talk about Anna tonight. So if you go to the New Testament and you go to the book of Luke, she's in Luke chapter 2. Okay, uh, my first big note in my notes tonight is Christmas is over, okay? So... (laughs) The whole Christmas story in this part of history where we're at has passed, okay? Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem. They had the baby, the whole angels and shepherds, and all that has happened, right? Um, They returned. The shepherds are home. um, Everything is done. Mary now has about a week of motherhood under her belt. Um, I don't know about you guys. The first week of having a baby was pretty much a blur. You don't remember anything because every single moment was spent feeding a baby, changing a baby, or trying to sleep, right? Because the baby doesn't sleep. You only sleep when the baby sleeps, right? And so I'm sure this first week for Mary, I mean, after having this huge buildup of not only not being at home, right? Remember, she's on the road. She's in another town. They had to go there for the taxes that were um, the the, um, census, thank you is the word I was looking for, in order to register for taxes, uh, and so she's, I, I don't know, did any of you guys have a baby not at home? Like, were you traveling or something when you had a baby? No, because we're not idiots. We stay home. Like, you know that in the last ninth month, you don't go anywhere. You just stay put until it comes. Because you know, once it does, it's a whirlwind. You know, there's so much that all you're trying to do is eat and sleep and, you know, that kind of thing. In any case, real life has begun. And we aren't told anything about that first week for her. It, the hard thing in the Bible is so many times we're just given milestones. And so we pick up with these milestones. The first is in, uh, in, chap- in Luke chapter 2. We see in the first, um, I'm sorry, it's not uh, verse 1, it's verse 21. So if you go to 221, it says, And when eight days were completed, so Jesus is now, little baby Jesus is eight days old. He doesn't look so squished right? You know how your baby looks like terrifying when they first come out? And then within a couple days, they look super cute. No brand new baby, unless it's a cesarean baby, looks super cute. They look so much better a few days later because they're all unsquished, right? It's like you've puffed out the vacuum bag on a pillow. Like all of a sudden, they're like whole, right? So now he's whole baby Jesus, eight days old. Um, It says, and wait, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, His name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Israel custom, you don't name a baby until eight days, especially sons. And a big part of that, I think, was because a lot of infants died then. And so you didn't, like, waste a family name on someone that was going to die. Once they hit eight days, you're like, all right, you know, they're going to make it. So they would circumcise them on the eighth day. Uh, and then they would also name them. So Jesus was given the name of Jesus, right, on that eighth day. So then it's kind of interesting because more time passes, and we jump to the next verse. Now it's about 40 days after he's older because it says in verse 22, now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Those days of purification were a thing where, do you guys remember after you had a baby and the doctor said, don't do anything for six weeks. You need time because your body's going to get back to normal. It's got some stuff to get rid of and then you'll get back to normal. Uh, I wish I had had more information about those six weeks when I had a baby. I felt like I was prepared. I got one of those books, the whole um, what to expect when you're expecting. And I, with my first baby, right, with Alora, I read that every week. I wanted to know what everything was and every possible contingency plan. 
I'm a perfectionist and an overachiever and a control freak. So I wanted to know it all. And so I felt pretty prepared, like when labor and stuff came, that like I, I kind of knew what was going on. And then after I had the baby, I was like, oh my gosh, my body is completely falling apart. Like, I think I skipped that chapter. Um, but in any case, in the Old Testament, they had, the women basically had to wait 40 days. So after 40 days, she was considered, she could go to the temple and do this offering, and then she would be considered pure again. Because if she, kind of like for her, okay, we're women, right? For the menstrual cycles in the Old Testament, they had to be put away out of the camp during that week. And afterwards, they would wash and they'd do this thing, and then they could come back. And anything they touched during that time was considered impure. So... It was the same after they had a baby. They had to wait a little while, and then they would come and do this ceremony. So we know this is about 40 days. So Jesus is in for his, like, one-month checkup, right, basically, um, at this point. They also had this thing in the Old Testament where they, I don't want to get into all this. This isn't our study. But um, they had this thing where the firstborn son belonged to the Lord of every Israelite. And if you wanted to keep him <laughs> and not leave him at the temple, you had to give an offering. You basically had to redeem your own baby to buy him back from the Lord kind of thing, saying, all right, God, this is your son, but I'm going to take him home, so I'll leave an offering for you. It's kind of a weird thing. It's an interesting study, but they had to go give this offering for Jesus because he was their firstborn son too. Um, in any case, that's why they come to Jerusalem. Now, my um, inductive Bible study classes always kick in for me in verses like this because I'm like, where are they coming from? Did they stay in Bethlehem, like in that stable for 40 days? I doubt it. I'm sure they found kind of a more permanent digs, but I don't know if it was in Bethlehem or if it was. It doesn't make sense for them to travel all the way back home to travel all the way back again to Jerusalem because Bethlehem is only like a mile, two miles from Jerusalem. So I don't know. I just, I'll be interested to find all, all those details later of where were they in this in-between time. In any case, Jesus is 40 days old. They're coming to the temple to do Mary's purification and to do the redemption buying Jesus back part. That's where our story opens up, okay? So Jesus is a little tiny baby, and Joseph and Mary are bringing him to the temple this day. Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever woken up and had one of those days where you had an unexpected encounter with people, that you just didn't plan it, you thought you were going to the grocery store, and God says, no, you're going to the grocery store, but I have someone there I want you to connect with, or I have someone here that I want you to meet. And you just didn't know that today was the day you were going to meet somebody important or that God had something in your life. They had that kind of moment. They were going to the temple. They knew it was a big day. They knew it was a day of, you know, doing all these things that they needed to get done. But they run into two people at the temple that they just didn't expect, that God knew, though. They were one of those divine appointments, as our Christianese likes to call them, right? The first divine appointment uh, was a man named Simeon, and you can read his story uh, in verses 25 through 35. He gets 10 verses, this guy Simeon. He's pretty cool. Basically, God was keeping a promise to him that God had made a long time ago that Simeon would not die until he saw the Messiah. So he gets there that day, and guess who comes that day? Is little baby Jesus, right? He doesn't get to see the whole redemption. He doesn't get to see the whole picture, but he does get to see the beginning of the picture, knowing that God is doing what God said he was going to do. It's pretty cool. Um, I love it when God gives us these little surprises in our day. It makes each day as a Christian exciting because we just don't know what he has for us this day. Sometimes it's pretty cool. In any case, uh, Joseph and Mary are left amazed. They're just in wonder about this visit from Simeon and what God has done to orchestrate this. And then we get our second surprise encounter, and that's where we pick up Anna's story. So we're going to pick up Anna's story. I'm going to read all three verses because there's only three of them, and then we'll come back and kind of talk about them. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 36, it says this. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age <laughs> and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. 
So you can picture her, as soon as Simeon's done doing this whole thing, all of a sudden comes this little of a great age woman, right? And she's got her own moment with Jesus, this little baby Jesus that she recognizes who he was. I want to break down her story a little bit. There are three little verses. They're short, but they're super sweet. Let's look at the facts. Age. She was of a great age. How old? Well, if we do the math with the numbers we're given here, right, she got married and lived with a husband for seven years, and then he died. And then it reads that she went 84 years as a widow. So you put that together, and let's say she got married really young, like 13 young, okay, because that was pretty typical back then. So 13, she's married. She lived seven years with this husband, and he dies. She's a widow by the time she's 20. And then 84 years, that makes her 104, okay? So a great age is not an exaggeration. Um, even if some of the people are like, whoa, that's way too old. She couldn't be that old. They try to make it sound like 84 was like her whole life, like maybe she was 84. Okay, who cares? 84, 104, pretty great age, right? She's pretty old, basically. Uh, now, what we know of her is we know she doesn't have a husband. We know she was a widow for 84 years. Probably no children. There aren't any children mentioned. Um, and so I think it's pretty safe to say that she didn't have any in those seven years that she had been married to him. Probably because, too, if she had had children, she'd be living with them at this point. But she's living at the temple day and night, night and day, right? In every instance thus far that we've talked about a woman being barren, about a woman not having children. Remember, we've covered that curse umpteen times already in this study of our women of the Bible. There's been tons of them. Every single time we've talked about it, though, at one point, God gave them a son, right? Everyone, like Sarah, Rebecca, I mean, you go through any of their stories, and they were barren for a time, and then God gave them children, not Anna. Anna is one story who was barren and never had children again, she, and she never got married again. She stayed a widow. I don't know why. Maybe she was really ugly or really poor, or I know, the Bible doesn't say. The only thing it tells us about her is she was super old. Well, thank you, Lord. That's a great description. <laughs> well, I guess I'll take that adjective. But we don't know. We aren't told why she never married again, but she didn't. I feel like her story is really different um, because most of the other ones, God answered the prayers, right? Eventually, God gave them the desire of their heart and, and had a whole plan to, like, work out a miracle on their behalf. He didn't give Anna a miracle. And I'm kind of looking at her like, why? What's different about her that she didn't get a miracle? Right, that she didn't get everything she was looking for. Most people that see her story right there would say, oh man, poor Anna. Like she's a tragedy. She loses a husband. She never gets remarried. She never has children. Like how sad. What a sad story. But when you read her story, it's anything but sad. While the years were no doubt very difficult, and no doubt those 84 years had lots of tears, and lots of lonely times. Uh, her problems in her life don't define her moment. They don't define her time in the Bible. It's not, oh yeah, Anna, that widow who never had kids and died. It's Anna, that widow who got to see baby Jesus. Like, we're going to talk about that for a second. God had something different for her. Her tragedies did not crumble her into defeat. She didn't become just a saying or a person everyone just felt bad for. What the enemy means for evil, God can use for good. And I'm not saying God killed her husband, but I'm saying when things like that happen and we think, why God, what are you doing? God can do something amazing out of it because he's so big and infinitely creative and full of love for us that Satan can't do anything to us that God can't fix or make better or make new or make into something amazing. God, the, the enemy can crack your vessel in 150 different ways, and God has 1 million and 50 different ways to fix it because he's so big and so awesome and so good. The Lord could have made Anna's stories like the other. He could have made a barren woman have a kid. He, we, we know he could. He's done it before. He could have given her a new husband and a new family and a new life. And her story could have been just like everybody else's. But it wasn't. And it wasn't for his good purpose. 
God didn't need another Sarah or another Rebecca or another Hannah or Elizabeth. Instead, God made Anna an Anna. And I love that because I think of us. Sometimes we compare our stories with other people's. Lord, you've done this for them before. You provided this way for them before. You, you know, you work in this way. Why not me? Why is my story not the same as all these stories? Because I know you can do it, God. And the Lord looks at me and says, yes, but in my infinite creativity, I want to make a different one. Can I use you to make a different story that doesn't look like everybody else's, but that has a different facet of my glory? So that when people see you, they think, oh my gosh, look what God did with this person in this situation. And I'm like, yeah, I volunteer, <laughs> right? Because when God's the one handling the story, we're not afraid of how it's going to turn out. We know it's going to be beautiful no matter what it looks like. I keep seeing that as I'm reading her tiny little story that didn't look like everyone else's. And I think, oh man, Anna, you have a pretty awesome story. What makes her story so special is not her tragedy. We all have elements of tragedy. What makes her story so beautiful was her service. When we see who she was and what she did with her life, right? We see that she was a prophetess. It says that in verse 36, she was a prophetess. That means she was somebody that God spoke to directly. Now, remember, this is before the New Testament is written. They do have the Old Testament in scrolls and everything by now. So they have some of the word of God. But God chose in the old times to speak to some people directly, to tell them what he wanted to share with everyone. And that was the job of a prophet. And only a handful of women in the Bible are prophetesses. Okay? Prophetesses. Female prophets. God gave them this special job where he was going to talk to them and they were going to talk to everyone else on his behalf. He chose Anna to be one of those people. And I don't know if it's because she had so much more time to be able to hear him without the other voices of a husband and children and other needs pulling on her that she was able to be dedicated to hear the word of the Lord. We as women are busy women, especially when you throw in a husband and kids. Like one kid is one, and then every kid after that multiplies by a thousand, right? Because you have 10 voices now, you know, coming at you. And I don't know if maybe that's why she was able to be a prophetess, because she had that sole dedication of hearing the Lord's voice. Pretty cool. Uh, I 100% believe, though, that her position as a prophetess is possible because of the other parts of service we see here. And we see them right here. It says very specifically that Anna did not depart from the temple, verse 37, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. She drew near to the Lord, and the Lord drew near to her, like that verse promises us in James, right? God is always there. He's always available to us, but we don't sense it. Our eyes aren't open to it until we start drawing near to him. And then we say, oh my goodness, he's right there the whole time, right? Um, let's talk about this a little bit. She did not depart from the temple. She found her place in being near to God. It's possible she was given a room, like by where the priests and stuff slept um, in the temple because she was a prophetess um, and also because she was a widow. It's possible. That's not unheard of in the temple times where a prophetess or, or a woman would live at the temple for that. Um, or it's possible she just made herself there every public opening. <laughs> She'd get there in the morning and leave at night. Um, either way, she made it a priority to be near the Lord and near his people. She made that choice to be at the temple day and night. Um, I think that's pretty awesome. I think that's pretty awesome. The other thing it talks about is fastings and prayers that she served the Lord with. Fastings, we know, is when you give up food, right? And it's not just giving up food for, you know, trying to be an anorexic or lose weight. Um, as women, sometimes it's like, you know, this fasting could benefit me in more than one way. No, the fasting purpose of it is denying the physical to give place to the spiritual. Lord, I'm going to skip lunch today because I just need to draw near to you. I just need to talk to you. And this is a time that I have where normally I spend this 20 minutes eating or making lunch or whatever. Um, instead of that, I'm taking my time to pray. That's the whole point of fasting is to to deny the self so that you can be closer to the Lord. Now, sometimes people fast in general, 
just because they just want to draw near to the Lord. They just want time with him. Um, some fast for very specific reasons. If you have something that's just been weighing on your heart or someone that's been weighing on your heart and you really want to pray about this specific situation, you fast. You take that time to lift this one specific thing up to the Lord. Um, now, you can get into fasting so you can read more about it. There are different people have different opinions. Well, you can fast your cell phone or you could fast, you know, I don't know, shopping. Okay, but there's something very powerful about fasting food. You don't read anyone giving up sugar in the Bible as a fast. You read about them not eating or drinking, and you're like, whoa. I mean, sometimes they didn't drink for 40 days. And you think, well, how did they survive? God sustained them. He did it. Now, I, you know, I want to say check with your doctor. They'll probably tell you, no, don't do that for 40 days. But if the Lord tells you to, he'll make, you, he'll, he'll make it through. And you'll know from him when to break that fast and when to go. But that's a training. It's a practice. Now, I'm going to be very real with you. I hate fasting. I hate it. I hate it with every fiber of my being. I grew up with really strong stomach acids. And so sometimes when I miss a meal, I feel like I'm going to faint. I get all sweaty and wobbly and I don't know it's probably because I haven't disciplined truly I haven't disciplined myself to do it I'm so afraid of the side effects that I just don't I'm like all that sugar it's not really that hard I mean I have so much sugar that it's like (laughs) missing it for a day maybe that's why I'm weak truly because I eat so much of it but I really want to get and I have had periods of my life like I remember when I was in Bible college and I was praying about this boy that I really liked that I just thought he was the bee's knees, and I just wanted him to like me, and I wanted to marry him. And so the Lord was like, hey, why don't you take this time to pray about it, to make sure that your heart's in the right place, to make sure that you're seeking me first. You're at Bible college for me, not for him, right? And so I made a thing with the Lord where I said, all right, every Monday for the rest of this semester, on Mondays, I'm just going to skip lunch. I'm not going to skip a whole day because I've got school and i got things i got to focus on, but Mondays, I'm going I'm to leave all my friends, and I'm going to go... And then they made Monday's Burger Monday, and I was like, dang it, it's like one of the best meals in school. I'm like, no, Lord, you're still worth it. And I remember even after I started dating this boy, um, his name's Mark, by the way. Yes, we got married. And it's not because I fasted, okay? That's not the lesson. But even after we started dating, I kept doing it that semester, and I just started reading 1 Corinthians 13 every Monday of what love really looks like. And it was, Andrea, if you're going to love this boy and you want him to love you, First, learn what love looks like. What is it really? Is it dating and good feelings and all this stuff? No, these are the ways I want you to be. And it was beautiful, and it was such a good time. And every Monday, it was, I'd think of an excuse. Oh, well, you know, it is Burger Monday, or, you know, I've got a big test later today, Lord. I don't know if I can focus. And the Lord would say, come and be with me. Just come and be with me. It's one meal. You're going to eat later. You know you will. You'll, You'll be fine. I'll take care of you. But come and be with me. And, man, it was beautiful. And so I even think now, sometimes I think, oh, I'm going to fast about it. And then that next day, I'm like, nah, (laughs) right? We have to be purposeful. Fasting is something you plan and you mark it out and you go do it. And you think afterwards, if you missed that meal, did I really need it? Or was this time so much better? It's a sacrifice, which leads me into prayers, okay? She served God Uh, in fastings and prayers night and day. And prayers, we all know, right, is talking to God, just talking to him, being open with him and communicating with him. I think Anna prayed about her country, Israel. I think she prayed about herself. I think she would sit at the temple and watch people come in and pray for them. I think she was that kind of woman. Um, I mean, otherwise, what else are you going to pray for, <laughs> right? You ever run out of things to pray? I think being amongst people, she constantly had someone to pray for. And there was no doubt in my mind that people who came to the temple often knew exactly who to go ask for prayer. Hey, this is going on in my life. I need to go find Anna. I know exactly where Anna's going to be, and I know Anna will pray for me. You know the people in your life who you can ask for prayer that you know they're actually going to do it and not just say they'll pray for you. You have those warriors, hopefully. And if not, start learning who they are. Ask, hey, who's a prayer warrior? Who's someone that you ask for prayer? Because I need prayer about something. You don't just throw it off as a blanket to the universe. You find those people you know will pray. I think Anna was probably sought out for praying. I always like the acronym for prayer of ACTS, or um, ACTS, 
where the A is for adoration, um, and C is for confession, and T is for thanksgiving, and then the S is for supplication. So basically, you start with praising God for who he is, and then confessing anything he brings in your heart of saying, Lord, I messed up on this, and I'm so sorry. Then you go to thanksgiving and thanking him for everything for the day. And then you go to ask him whatever it is you're going to ask him. (laughs) The supplication part, right? Sometimes we skip everything except the supplication, and we miss out on those precious moments of communicating our praise and thanksgiving and all those things. Um, This was her service. This was her job every day. This was her nine to five, was praying and fasting for people. And I also believe it was a gift. I think there are special people that are gifted in prayer. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I can't practice it and get better at it and maybe even become someone who has that gift, but I think there are people who are just naturally inclined to prayer, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, Instead of one husband and one family to take care of and pray for, God gave her many, and it was through her prayers that she served this family that God gave her. I don't even think she always knew her family's name. I think she'd see someone coming in weeping or coming into the temple for something and God would say, pray for them. And being a prophetess, I think God told her what to pray for. I think she had this connection there that was just cool. And I've seen that with some people who are prayer warriors, who they just seem to have this intuition about things and about situations and about people. And you think, how did you know that? And you just know they have this little, there's something there that God knows he can tell them something and God knows they'll pray for it. It's pretty awesome when he does that. Now, I don't want to do this to say that we all need to be Anna. That's not today's lesson. Because I grew up thinking that. Reading Anna's story, I always thought, oh man, Lord, it'd be amazing to be an Anna. And if my husband ever dies, I'm going to be a widow for the rest and just spend all day at church praying for people. Okay, this is me in my 12-year-old, 16-year-old mind whenever I read this story, thinking, man, she's so cool, and I could do that and fast and pray all night, all day, and just be at God's temple every day. Um, no. <laughs> Why? This is her calling. This is her story and who God had her to be. And then I was thinking, okay, Lord, but if this is not who I'm supposed to be, I can't be at the church every day. Why? God did give me a husband and three kids, and he's told me very clearly, this is your ministry right now. These three little kids are the most important people in your life because no one's going to love them like you do. Jean loves them pretty close, but not as much as I do, right? My mom doesn't love them as much as I do. Her and Jean are on equal ground there. But... um, but I'm their mom, and I am Mark's wife, and I am his biggest supporter, his biggest source of encouragement and, and praise and strength and all those things he needs me to be, and probably aggravation and, you know, all those other things I am. I like to focus on the positive. Glass is half full. But truly, it's one of those things where right now, if I'm here every day, all day, praying and helping other people, no one's serving my family, and that's not okay with the Lord. My job is to be where I am. Now, if one day my kids grow up and Mark dies, okay, I don't know if you're like me. I have visions about what his funeral looks like and what I'm wearing, and I'm pretty morbid. I go into those things. But if he ever dies, not that I want him to. I want us to grow up. We've already made an agreement we're going to die together in a car accident. Um, When we're like, you know, 90, we'll just go together, and it'll be painless. It'll be really quick. If he breaks that agreement, we're going to have a hard conversation. But... um, In any case, if the Lord for some reason gave me an opportunity like this, it would have to be from him, and it would have to be a gift or a a season that he gave me for that. But I'm not her, and you're not her. Okay, so where am I going in this lesson? Why are we studying her, Andrea, if you keep telling us all these awesome things and then telling us that that they're not you? Because there are elements of her story that should be our story no matter where we're at. If we're at the temple, if we're at home, if we're at the job, if we're old, if we're young, if we're middle-aged, it doesn't matter. Parts of Anna's service should be our service, okay? And specifically, I'm talking about serving the Lord in whatever it is you're doing. Serving the Lord at your job, serving the Lord cleaning the dishes, serving the Lord in laundry, it's still being with him day and night and night and day. Because the Lord is not confined to a temple. The Lord is not confined to a Bible study or a church. 
when we invite him to walk with us every day in whatever we're doing, we're being in Anna, in being with him every day, whatever that looks like. And I think prayer and fasting should be important. Now, we talked about fasting a little bit. Let's talk a little more about prayer. Maybe you're like me, and sometimes we treat prayer as secondary. When someone gets hurt or someone needs help, we think, what can I do for you right now? And they go, well, you can pray for me. In my mind, I go, well, I can only pray, or I can just, I use the word just in my head, just prayer. Is there anything else I can do? Can I bring you a meal? Can I watch your kids? Can I whatever? And they go, honestly, I just need prayer. And I go, oh, okay. And I might pray a little. I will stop. I'm trying to be better when someone texts, like today my mom texted, hey, so-and-so needs prayer. I try to stop right then and pray. But I really only pray for about a minute or two because, I mean, they're in the middle of school or I'm in the middle of something else. I will pray. But I can't say that I'm like, Anna praying right then. Now, let me be a little more specific, okay? I'm not really doing anything, so I guess I'll just pray (laughs) is the wrong attitude. Now, I'm not saying that prayer has to be an hour long, but prayer should be a service. We should look at prayer as if it was something we were going to do focusedly, intently, on purpose, and not just a Well, Lord, help that person today. Okay, here's my other thing, right? When I say, yeah, I'll pray about it, do I? Or do I just think about it and then look back and say, well, I thought about it, so I must have been praying about it. Or were you just thinking about it? There's a difference when you're talking to God about something and when you're just thinking about something. Anna's prayers were intentional. They had purpose. They had her entire attention while she was doing them. She treated them as if prayer was the job, okay? So if someone said, hey, I need you to make me a meal, you'd be like, okay, and then you'd plan the meal. You'd take time to plan it out. You'd make sure you had all the ingredients, and if not, go to the store. You would get that recipe together and start making the meal. It would probably take time, right, to plan all that and put it together. All that while you were doing something, it had your attention, it had your energy. If it didn't, your recipe didn't turn out very good. Sorry, they won't tell you that because they'll be grateful, but I bet it went in the trash if you were totally focused on something else while you were making their meal. Um, Prayer should be the same thing. We should look at it as if prayer was the job. That means everything else gets set aside, and we intentionally spend that time praying. Jesus said very specifically, when you pray, go into your room, close the door in the closet, and when you're in there, pray to your Heavenly Father. Now, my closet's very full. I can't do that in my closet. It's packed, but I can do that by my bedside. And so this week, as I've been reading this and thinking about this, and and the Lord's been convicting me about my own prayers, um, I've been trying to do that. Stop whatever I'm doing, shut the door, get alone, be quiet, and sit and actually pray about it. Be intentional about what I'm praying for. Again, it doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be seven hours. But whatever I would have spent doing the task that I thought I could do for them, cleaning their house or making them a meal, why not spend that equal time praying and see that as if it was that important of a job? If making the meal was going to take two hours, am I willing to give that same two hours praying? I would have been making the meal anyway, right? It's not like I'm losing time. I was willing to spend those two hours making a meal, or whatever it is you were going to do for them, go grocery shopping or clean their house or bathroom or something, spend that equal time in prayer, intentional, focused prayer. I don't do that. And the Lord really was touching my heart about that this time reading through here. Now there, again, is nothing wrong with quick prayers. They're actually very important and very needed. If you're driving down the street and someone says, hey, I'm in an emergency, can you pray for me? There's nothing wrong with praying right then and there with your eyes open while you're driving. Just realize that that prayer, you know, it is what it is. It's a quick emergency prayer. God hears those just as much as any prayer. But if there's something God's put on your heart where you get home and you can park the car and take an hour to pray, that's, that's in te- there's effective prayer. There's fervent prayer. There's prayer when it's not just a one-minute thing or a two-minute thing. Do you, there's a difference. Do you get that? Okay, so my sister asked, my little sister, Megan, she probably asks for prayer 25 times a week. 
I'm not kidding. You could look at my phone. Oh, please pray for me today. I have a headache. Please pray for me today. Jordan threw up. Please pray for me today. I have this Bible study coming up, but whatever. Please pray for me today. And honestly, as a sister, I get like, come on, Megan. Like, this is real life. I have other things to do than sit and pray for you every... So, but I'm like, all right, those are prayers to me sometimes where I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm going to pray for two minutes because I know you're going to heal Jordan from this sick and this and ask Megan for... Ask for more patience for Megan today for this and that. I might just spend quick prayers on those. (laughs) Not that I'm not intentional or that I'm not lifting her up, but there's also things where then there's deep things that the Lord puts on my heart of, hey, so-and-so suffering from brain cancer. Like, could you pray for that person? And there's someone I know and I love and I've, I'm hurting for them and I'm, you know, or if Megan sends something where it's really big, there was a big prayer request she gave me Sunday that has been on my heart that's been, you know what I mean? There is a different thing there. And that's when I'm like, all right, Lord, with this one, help me to be more intentional and more focused and give it my time and my energy. Hopefully this is making sense to you guys. Hopefully this is something that's encouraging you. I don't want it to you scare you away saying, well, I'm half doing something. Can I still pray? Yes, pray and invite the Lord in while you're washing the dishes or while you're doing your little girl's hair. Whatever it is you're doing that, you know, your focus is half there. It's still good for half your focus to be there in prayer. That's a good thing. But if the Lord puts something on your heart that you're really serious about, make sure you're giving it your full focus and your full attention. I have a confession to make. This is super embarrassing. So I had written this Bible study uh, early this week. I'd got it done early because I had some free hours on Friday. And so Sunday, yeah, yesterday, I started to go back through my study, and I phoned it in. I put on my headphones, and I turned on a show while I was going through my Bible study. I never do that, but I started doing it yesterday, and I don't know why I thought that was okay. I was thinking, all I have to do is proofread my thing, make sure I'm in the right categories and I know what I'm saying. And I probably got about five minutes into it when the Lord goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm listening to a show and working on my Bible study. He goes, is your show about me? No. What kind of influence are you passively absorbing while you're studying my word? You're going to be, didn't I give you that whole lesson on? focus on attention and I go oh my gosh I can't believe I did that so I stopped I'm like all right I'm gonna stop my Bible study right now I can't continue it right now and then I went to work on something else and then I spent some time on my knees saying Lord I am so sorry that I thought I could do something important that you're giving me while not giving it my full attention while giving it half of my attention, and letting the world fill in my thoughts while I'm doing your thing. I make mistakes, and the Lord constantly, constantly is telling me, Andrea, oh, Lord, that was bad. That was like novice. I mean, super amateur stuff is taking in something totally not of you while working on something of you. Let me say this. When you pray, go in your room, shut the door, and shut off any outside influence because that outside influence will constantly barrage you and try to make its way in. You have to be intentional about prayer. You have to be intentional about the things of the Lord. Yes, you can passively input stuff. I can listen to music and all that stuff while I work, while I do my job. I can listen to the radio and it doesn't bother all that. I can listen to something while I'm doing the dishes. It doesn't matter. It only takes half my attention. But if I want full output on something, you can input passively. But if you want to output anything of quality, it needs your full attention, especially prayer and especially the things of God. He needs your full attention for those 10 minutes or an hour or whatever it is you're giving him. Full, okay? Don't, don't do my thing. That was just, the Lord will slap you and be like, what are you doing? Oh, gotcha, Lord. Okay. Others have discovered the power of prayer. Um, Oh, I'll get into them in just a second. One more thing about Anna. I like that it says she gave herself in service to God with fastings and prayer night and day. I talked about how fasting is sacrificing to spend that time with the Lord. When I see her praying night and day, I don't think it's because she couldn't sleep. You and I all pray on those nights we can't sleep. I think she intentionally gave up sleep to pray. I see that also as a sacrifice. 
She said, you know what, Lord, for this hour, my body's tired and I want to go to bed, but you put something on my heart, and I want to spend an hour praying for that. Or in the middle of the night, she'll set her, the Lord would wake her up, I'm sure, and she'd say, I'd really rather go back to sleep, Lord. And the Lord said, no, I want you to pray for this person right now. I want you to get out of bed. I want you to get uncomfortable. Stand up if you have to in the middle of the kitchen where nothing can put you back to sleep and pray for me for just a little bit. Sacrifice your sleep, sacrifice your thing, and pray. And I think, oh, Lord, that's big too. And I think there's something effective about our prayers when we're sacrificing something for that prayer. Not that the Lord hears it better or that it's more special, but I think it, the Bible says The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And if we want to see that much availed in whatever it is we're looking at, I think sometimes it's sacrificial. Prove me wrong if you don't believe me, okay? Prove me wrong. You can show me next week if you think I'm wrong. And like I said, others have found this. The apostles in Acts chapter 6 when there was a big ministry problem in the church and something came to their attention, they said, no, 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 no. That ministry part is not for us. We'll appoint other people to do that because they said we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the study of the word, the ministry of the word. They gave it their important time in prayer. It wasn't just studying the word so that they could preach. It was, no, we can't spend time doing that ministry because prayer is our first ministry and the study of the word is our second ministry, the ministry of the word. Um, I think maybe that's why they were so powerful in the early church, because they gave such weight to prayer. Uh, A man named uh, Cliff Barrow said this, when Billy Graham, I love Billy Graham, I'm loving him more and more as I get older, Um, just reading his things and listening to his things, man, he was such a cool guy. When Billy Graham was asked about the most important steps in preparing for an evangelical outreach, he always answered that there were three things that mattered most when setting up these big events. Prayer, prayer, and prayer. And I thought, man, that's so true. And sometimes we think, oh, you know, we put the prayer on hold. We don't give the, we think, oh, it's going to go great. It's going to be such a great event. Why? Why should it be a great event this time? Our women's retreats, they've always been awesome. But do we just go on the assumption that God's going to make it awesome again? Or do we ask him for it? Do we invite him to it? Do we make him a part of all the preparations and things? We've been trying to get together as a leader group at least every other month or so on our busy schedules to already be praying for this event coming up because we know if God isn't a part of it, it's just a mini vacation. But when he comes, it's a retreat and it's a powerful thing where the Lord can move and work. But I only believe that's possible because it's been bathed in prayer, right? Um, Charles Spurgeon said, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this, the measure of the intensity of your prayer. And I thought, oh man, please don't take my temperature this week. It would have been cold, right? Lord, make us intense and purposeful in our prayer. Uh, I had a whole story. I'm not going to get into it. We'll pass on that. Okay, this service is not just for those of a great age. Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen any Christian movie about prayer. I think specifically of the Kendrick Brothers movie that came out a couple years ago, War Room. I picture the little old lady as a prayer warrior. I asked Mark this week, I'm like, when you think of a prayer warrior, who do you think of? And he's like, I don't think of a prayer warrior. I'm like, okay, come, but seriously, like, what do you picture? He goes, I know what you picture. I said, what? Well, what do I picture? He said, a little old lady in a prayer closet because of that movie. Well, yeah. Okay, and then I read a Christian, I was reading a Christian novel this last week, and in it there were these prayer warriors that were covering this whole, like, demonic, like, problem. And, of course, they were both two old retired ladies, right, that had, you know, one was a former missionary and one was the dude's landlord. And it was like, uh, that's how I always picture, little old ladies with tons of time on their hand. They can be the prayer warriors. And I think to myself, you know, well, maybe I'll be a prayer warrior when I'm old and have nothing to do. Ignorant, I know, I'm a fool to think that, like that I won't have anything to do when I'm older. (laughs) That's a lie. Any older person can tell you we have a million and one things to do, right? It's just as busy as when we were young. Maybe you got a little more time, but truly, the Lord was telling me, Andrea, it's not about age, it's about your priorities. It's about your purpose in praying. You can be a a prayer warrior when you're 16, if that is your focus and your intent and the way you're serving the Lord. 
you could be just as powerful as the lady who's 104 of a great age. Your prayers may not be quite as mature as a woman who's known to sit and quietly listen to the Lord all those years, but you got to start somewhere, and it's about priorities, sacrifice and dedication, and that awful word, discipline. I hate that word, but that's how the Lord works, practice and discipline and, and sacrifice, right? We can all serve this way and be better women of God because of it. We must, if we want, we must pray if we want to be ready for whatever's coming. You go back to that story here in the New Testament where Jesus came down from the mount, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And what's waiting for them at the bottom of this beautiful experience is a demon-possessed kid. Because whenever we come down from a mountaintop, Satan's waiting for us in the valleys, right? So the enemy is there, and the disciples had all been trying to cast out this demon, and it wouldn't leave. And they're perplexed. They'd never come across this before, something they couldn't handle spiritually. And so after Jesus exercises this demon, privately they ask him, why couldn't we do it? We've done this a hundred times. We've practiced this before, and nothing happened. And Jesus told him this was a very specific kind of spiritual demon that can only come out by prayer and fasting. And I think, you and I think sometimes, Lord, I've done this a hundred times. I've taught Bible study a hundred times. I could do this on, you know, automatic. And the Lord says, mm, you don't know what's coming around the corner where there's going to be something you can't handle. Even if you've handled a hundred times before, even if you've done it, this one's different and it takes preparation. Now, I don't think Jesus expected the disciples to go, oh, I need to go fast for, uh, we'll meet you next week and take care of the demon because I have to go fast, right? Jesus was telling his disciples, you need to be praying and you need to be fasting because something's going to come up that you will then be ready for. You will then be ready. We need to be prepared. Billy Graham <laughs> said this, true prayer is a way of life, not just for use in cases of emergencies. Make it a habit and when the need arises, you will be in practice. Oh, Lord, may it be so. Anna was ready. She was ready. And I think that's why um, Luke says, verse 38, and coming in that instant, <laughs> she knew the instant Jesus was ready for her. When she, she, because she was ready for Jesus in that instant. And I think it's because she was already in tune. God had already said, hey, guess what? This morning there's going to be a special visitor. There he is. And she goes, I'm right here, Lord. I'm already ready. In that instant, she was right there, ready to see him, ready to receive him. Um, just awesome. And I think, Lord, I want to be ready. Whatever comes up this week, whatever situation presents itself or opportunity you bring, I want to be ready for it because I've been praying and fasting, right? Hopefully I'll do some this week. <laughs> Got to be intentional about it. And I love it because she was ready and because she gave thanks to the Lord she then spoke of him to all of those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. There was a lot of people looking for redemption in that day. Rome was in control and nobody was happy about it. They were constantly upset with the government, constantly upset with the rulers of their city and the things going on. And every day it was, oh, just groanings. When is Messiah coming? When is Messiah coming? Sound like today, right? where everyone's upset with the government and no one's happy with the way things are running and every day just feels like a slog, there's lots of people looking for redemption, waiting for the end of when will this get better? When will this change? And Anna was ready there to talk to them. She was ready to speak of him, of Jesus, to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. When we have those people that God drops in our lives saying, oh, when is this ever going to end? And oh, I'm so, I hate this. This world is so awful. Are we ready with the word about Jesus, about hope, about his life that he can bring, about his love that's there for us? That's who we want to be. We want to be women who are ready, ready with an answer to share. She had a message of hope and joy for those who were weary and downtrodden. She had a message of peace for those who showed up anxious and stressed at the temple. And the answer was Jesus. He's here. I saw him. He's, it's in motion. Messiah is here. We're ready for it. Salvation was already on its way. 
And that's the message we have. He's here. He is risen. He's coming back. I've seen him work. I've seen him provide. I've seen him fill in the blank. And we can share that comfort with others. Maybe you've been through great tragedy or loss, like a widow. Maybe God has never given you children or a much sought-after blessing, and you find yourself barren. Maybe you've been all alone for years and years and years and years and struggled with loneliness. Maybe you can't physically serve in some way, and so you feel like, what good am I in the church? What good am I here? I, right now, I can't serve this season for whatever reason. But maybe God is calling you deeper. Maybe God is calling you to something else right now in this season. Let Anna be an inspiration. You can't be her. That's her story. But you can say, Lord, what's my story supposed to look like? And how can I be doing it in the way you want me to do it right now? Who do you want me to be serving? And how can I serve them? Prayer is essential and not secondary. It is our service. It is the job of helping. It's more important than a meal (laughs) or cleaning or whatever it is you want to do for that friend to help. Prayer is more important. The meal is secondary, okay? The whatever else was secondary. The prayer is the most important. And it should be intentional. It should be sacrificial. It should be purposeful. They'll help us be ready for Jesus in an instant if we're women of prayer. And it'll help us be ready to share his hope with others who are searching. There are tons of great books on prayer. There are tons of terrible books on prayer. (laughs) There are ones that say, you name it and claim it, right? Make sure if you're reading a book on prayer, it's lining up with what scripture teaches about prayer. A really good book that I've read before um, is by Chuck Smith, and it's called An Effective Prayer Life. It's a really short, really tiny book, and there's actually places that have it free online as just a PDF. It's like 86 pages on a PDF. Um, And so... If you want to know where that you can find it, you can find me afterward and I'll tell you. Uh, but it, looking into prayer is a good thing. Strengthening our prayer life is only going to help us, no matter what um, walk of life we're in. Um, I want to close. We have just a second. I want to close by reading you a kid's book. So um, I cannot recommend this book enough, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, You might recognize it a little bit. We used it in last year's Christmas, not last, not 2021, 2020's Christmas program. We used some of its words and things in our kids' choir thing. Um, Whenever my son Gavin, he's in first grade, whenever he has a Bible story we're supposed to read in school, I always look and see if that story's in the Jesus Storybook Bible first because I love, love, love it. It's written The whole thing is about Jesus. So every story that it tells from Moses and creation all the way up to the crucifixion, it's about Jesus and the whole plan to rescue mankind. Now, it doesn't have chat. It doesn't have like Exodus 2, 4, right? So you're not going to go in and find every story in the Bible. But for little kids starting to learn who Jesus is and what he's done for them, um, it's just my favorite on Good Friday, I used this book to read my kids, read to my kids the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection because they tell it in such a way for them to understand and to grasp his great love for us. So as I was looking at it today, um, it has a section that's covering the Lord's Prayer, right? When his disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. What, is the, what does that look like? John's disciples taught him how to pray. Can you teach us how to pray? So I just want to read you the little story of what it had in here because I thought, oh my gosh, it's so good. Okay, in those days, there were some extra super holy people. At least that's what they thought. And they were called Pharisees. Every day, they would stand out there in the middle of the street and pray out loud in big, extra, super holy voices. They were They really weren't praying so much as just showing off. They used lots of special words that were so clever no one understood what they meant. People walking by would stop and stare, which might sound rude, except that's exactly what the extra super holy people wanted. They wanted everyone to say, look at them, they're so holy. God must love those people the best. Now you and I both know that they were wrong. God doesn't just love holy people, but the people walking by weren't so sure. 
Perhaps you did have to be really clever or good or important for God to love you. Perhaps you had to know lots of difficult, clever words to speak to God. So one day, Jesus taught people how to pray. He said, when you pray, don't pray like those extra super holy people. They think if they say a lot of words, God will hear them. But it's not because you're so clever or good or so important that God will listen to you. God listens to you because he loves you. Did you know that God is always listening to you? Did you know that God can hear the quietest whisper deep inside your heart, even before you started to say it? Because God knows exactly what you need even before you ask him, Jesus told them. You see, God just can't wait to give you all you need. So you don't need to use long words or special words. You don't have to use a special voice. You just have to talk. So when you pray, pray in your normal voice, just like when you're talking to someone you love very much, like this. Hello, Daddy. We want to know you and be close to you. Please show us how. Make everything in the world right again and in our hearts too. Do what is best, just like you do in heaven. And please do it down here, too. Please give us everything we need today. Forgive us for doing wrong and for hurting you. Forgive us just as we forgive other people when they hurt us. Rescue us. We need you. We don't want to keep running away and hiding from you. Keep us safe from our enemies. You're strong, God, and you can do whatever you want. You are in charge, now and forever and for always. We think you're great, too. Amen. Yes, we do. You see, Jesus was showing people that God would always love them with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. So they didn't need to hide anymore or be afraid or ashamed. They could stop running away from God and they could run to him instead as a little child runs into her daddy's arms. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful that you <laughs> you like it when we just talk to you, when we are just real with you, Lord. You don't require a prayer warrior to know all these ins and outs and special words and incantations. All you ask is our time and attention as we lift up ourselves, our problems, our friends, our family, Lord, our the church. As we lift up others to you, God, you just want our focus. Father, you are so good, and you hear us no matter where we pray, no matter how we pray. You are our Father in heaven, Lord, and we are so thankful for you. Lord, I pray that you would, as you taught your disciples, teach us how to pray. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me for only giving you half my attention sometimes when the job required my full attention and energy. Forgive us, Lord, for neglecting you versus some other form of entertainment or selfish thought or whatever. Lord, teach us that discipline. Teach us to fast, Lord. Teach us to be women who give of ourselves for your kingdom and your work. Because, Lord, prayer matters. And you gave it to us as this special tool. Some of us don't even have it sharpened. Help us, Lord. Help us in this fight, Father, to to become prayer warriors. And, Lord, to do it in our way. I'm not Anna. I'm never going to be Anna. Lord, and these ladies, they're not me, and they're not each other. You have a special job for them in prayer. You have a special prayer language with them and how they talk to you. Teach us, Lord, in our own way to reach out to you, to connect with you, Lord, because there is so much power you have given us through it. Father, we, in our hearts and in our minds right now, we lift up those loved ones we've been praying for, for the cancers, Lord, for the counseling that others need, Father, and drawing close to you for the salvation of those we love. Father, we just lift them up to you again, and we ask that you would put them on our hearts. Remind us to pray, Lord. Holy Spirit, we need those little pins of reminder. Put them on our minds. Put them on our hearts, and teach us how to pray. Lord, thank you for Anna. Thank you, Lord, that she was widowed and didn't have kids. I know that sounds awful, Lord, but thank you for using that in her life to turn her into this woman, Lord, who's so inspiring and who is so in tune with you and ready in an instant for you. Thank you, Lord, for what you did in her tragedy. 
Father, take us and take our lives and take these meager offerings of what we have, Lord, and turn us into your own story. I pray for each woman here tonight, Lord, as they go forth this week, battling and doing whatever it is that they have to serve and do. Lord, be so close to them. Fill them with your spirit. Fill them with your love, constantly your love. <laughs> Remind them, God, over and over and over again how precious they are to you. Give them special unexpected blessings and visitings this week from you, Lord, just to show them that you're thinking of them and, and, and uh, loving on them, Lord. We love you too, Jesus. We're so grateful for you, and we lift up the rest of our week to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.